So hi everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Orviv and I'm the director of uh, Campus IL, Israel's national online platform for digital learning. Um, since it's an afternoon time and I'm, I have a direct competition between uh, your inner parts drawing bloods from your brain, uh, I'll start with a short story. Um, so this is uh, Rivital. Rivital is an elementary uh, school teacher uh, in Israel. She lives in a small town in the northern part, uh, the Galili. And Rivital is married to Rami and the mother of three beautiful children aged four to 12. This is Rami, Rivital's husband. He's a programmer in a local high-tech company, and he takes their kids from school on Tuesdays and on Fridays. Um, Rivital goes to her Pilates practice twice a week, Mondays and Wednesday afternoon. And the nearest teacher's training center is 20 kilometers from her home. Um, you see the blue spot over there? That's where Rami and Orvita live. And that's the nearest teacher's training center. Now, in general, the Ministry of Education in Israel offers 180 courses nationwide, but only 12 of them are delivered in that specific training center. And as you can see, um, Revitaz's agenda allows her to go there once a week only on Tuesday afternoon, meaning that all of this great variety of 180 courses, she could choose like two, right? Uh, and that's where the micro-credentials model comes. Uh, in the next... Uh, 30 minutes I'm going to share with you uh, the micro-credentials uh, model that was developed by an American nonprofit named Digital Promise. Um, but first, let me uh, tell you a few words about Campus AL. So Campus AL is, like I said, Israel's national digital learning platform, and it aims to give all Israeli citizens free access to education. Uh, we work on five different learning paths, uh, academic courses, uh, similar to edX, uh, high school matriculation prep. Uh, so in, in Israel, in order to go to uh, higher education, you need to pass the matriculation exam. And the MOOCs developed on our platform help students pass the matriculation. Um, Third pass is uh, government employees' professional development, which I will focus today. Uh, fourth is vocational training. We want to help Israelis find jobs and uh, um, get promotions in their workplaces. And fifth learning pass is 21st century skills, such as digital literacy, financial literacy, languages, etc. Campus AL has two brands, uh, an international brand where we are partner with edX.org. We have already uh, nine courses with 40,000 learners on uh, edX.org under the Israel X brand. And in the next autumn, you'll see uh, nine brand new ones. And we have a localized open edX instance uh, with three languages interface, Hebrew, Arabic, and English, and all the courses there are aimed for the uh, Israeli uh, civilians. So uh, let's go back to the um, digital promise micro-credential uh, model. So the principle behind that is the competency-based learning. Uh, so you take a very specific practical skill in the professional work life of an employee. Uh, for example, let's say I'm a teacher 
uh, I've gone through my uh, bachelor's degrees and my master's degrees, and I studied for at least four years, if we're talking about uh, Israel. Uh, and I have two students in my classroom who are defined by the welfare department of the municipality as youth at risk. So I need to address them a little differently. I need to understand the welfare uh, department protocol. And that's a competency that even if I learned uh, 10 years ago, I'm not that sure that I can implement it very effectively. And that's where the micro-credential model is uh, becoming active. It's very personalized, is, it focuses on uh, specific needs, competencies, and it's very practical. So how does it work? It starts by the teachers selecting the competencies that they want to improve or learn. Um, like I demonstrated before, the variety is almost in infinite, right? Because you can choose any of the 180 courses as opposed to the two or three or even 12 courses you could have chosen uh, going to your the, the uh, teacher's training uh, uh, community center next to your home. Um, then you collect, so in our pilot you need to collect three competencies, uh, go over three very short MOOCs, 10 hours of learner efforts each. You submit an authentic experiment or implementation of that competency within your classroom, within your school, and then you share it with your teacher's uh, community. Uh, the model was localized by an Israeli uh, company called CET, which is one of Campus IL partners, with the Israeli uh, Ministry of Education. And so let's take a look at uh, an example of uh, one MOOC. So there are six uh, stages to the MOOC. You start with learning, then you plan the activity around the competency you want to acquire you do some kind of an implementation of the competency within school, you document that, you make a reflection process, you upload that to the uh, Open edX platform, and then you peer review three other uh, documentation of three other teachers, and of course, three other teachers uh, are assessing your documentation. And then you get uh, credit. Uh, uh, in Israel, credit means uh, an additional ad addition to your salary. So all teachers in Israel go through trainings. Most of them don't necessarily go to the training they need because of the problem I shared uh, at the story in, in the beginning. Um, let's dive into this uh, MOOC. Uh, the, the example I want to share with you is a MOOC about how to give positive feedback to oral presentation. As you can see, this is a very, very specific skill. Um, so it starts with learning. Let's take uh, a look at, on one of the videos that was included in the MOOC. Okay, so that's clearly a teacher that did not go over this MOOC, right? Don't worry, we'll see her in action in a few minutes doing a better job. So after learning about the competency, reading some theories, and we can go to the next phase, which is planning. 
Uh, it's focused about the audience, about what is exactly your educational challenge, and writing down what do you plan to do as an activity. Then you write down um, all sorts of challenges that may arise during the implementation, and you go and implement. Uh, the most important part of the implementation is the, that, that it has to be authentic, meaning that you can't write a descriptive article about that. You need to include a audio, video, quotations of the process in order for other teachers to be able to authentically assess your, um, your documentation. Um, and then probably one of the most important parts is the reflection. Um, and throughout every stage, we see that the teachers, the learner, are uh, filling in surveys. This is very helpful for the instructional designers to improve the MOOC for the next time and to compare between different teachers. Now I know that you want to see, has this teacher improved? Let's take a look. Okay, there's hope. <laughs> um, so for every, uh, each and every MOOCs of the 31 courses I uh, demonstrated, uh, there is a similar process. Um, and the next one, which is uh, probably the most challenging, is the pre peer review. Uh, each of the teacher needs to fill a rubric about himself and reflect that in the peer assessment module and then assess three other teachers and get uh, uh, reviews from three other teachers taking that MOOC. Why is that a challenge? I will shortly explain. Um, so here are a few more examples. Um, be, I want to go over it because it's important to emphasize the fact that these MOOCs are around the competencies. So how to use electronic dictionaries. This, these MOOCs are for English teachers. Uh, how to understand the results of the screening test in the ABLE kit. How to use Google Quiz to enhance vocabulary teaching, etc. Um, now I'll share with you a few stats about the pilot. So firstly, and, um, this pilot is still running. It started in November uh, 2K17, and it will end on upcoming July. Uh, by now, we have uh, third, around 1,400 uh, um, registrants. Like I said, 31 courses and seven disciplines, different disciplines for elementary uh, school teachers. Um, so, a little MOOC stats. 67% uh, of the teachers signing up at the beginning of the year for the courses has en have enrolled for at least one course. 89% who submitted work have passed. That's a kind of uh, interesting fact because um, some research says that uh, peer review grades are lower than the grades you'll get uh, assessed by staff. And, and, and we, we can actually see that in, in the statistics of our pilot. Uh, the average final grade is uh, 87.7, which is lower than an average face-to-face uh, -face training uh, um, for teachers. Um, let's take a look at, uh, on a little learner's feedback. 
So 83% uh, state they studied the competency the course deal with for the first time. This was actually kind of stunning for us because all of these competencies are included in the, uh, this or that way in the curriculum of Teachers College. But as you can probably imagine, uh, focusing on that competency and is with a designated MOOC is very different than learning it as part of a four years curriculum without documenting, without making an authentic activity. 85% uh, said the learning aid them with planning class activity, and 92% said they are capable of facing the educational challenge the course deals with, which for us was, uh, we were very happy to see that uh, statement because that's the goal of, of the, this project. Um, now I'm going to move to some uh, lessons learned from the project. So the first thing, probably not surprising, but the, there is a tie connection between the course team involvement and the engagement of the learners. Uh, as opposed to publishing a book where when you finished writing the book, you, you, you've done your work, now it goes to the teacher's responsibility of how to use that book. In MOOCs, that's not the case. The work starts when the course, the first run of the course begins. Uh, and in that terms, we've seen that the more involved the person from the Ministry of Education was in marketing the course, in um, being, uh, attending the forums, uh, sending emails, the, the, the larger the engagement was. Um, another thing that we saw that the more specific the problem the MOOC dealt with, the more engaged the learner were. So if you, um, for example, name your MOOC at a very generic title, less teachers will choose it and the ones that will after reading the first uh, section, th they might drop out because that's not the reason they clicked enroll, right? Uh, so these are two things that we, we saw in, in, the, in the data. Um, and now we're looking ahead for the next court, which uh, uh, will begin in upcoming September. And here are some of our conclusions. Uh, the first one, which I've just no noted, very clear, very descriptive course page. The, the more focused, the more uh, um, clear you are, better chances the teachers will choose something they expect. Um, outcome gallery. So we had many and still have many legal issues with that, but we really want uh, to have our teachers share their work with their community. And that's also a very good marketing material. I, I can see that other teachers uh, did some activities that help them improve their work in class. If I could click a video or, or hear an audio, it, it, my trust in that course becomes much better. Um, I mentioned before the challenge with the aura and the uh, peer review. So one of the things that we saw that when there are uh, a small amount of teachers, the submission dates may vary and then there could be a situation where you're frustrated because you've submitted your work three weeks ago and didn't get any feedback um, and, and vice versa. Uh, 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 you got two works to assess and you're waiting for the third one uh, so we're now going to set the minimum number of teachers uh, uh, to a higher number. And uh, something that uh, everyone's working with Open edX, uh, knows that when you use external learning components such as uh, a storyline uh, or other components that do not support LTI, 
you don't get to learn a lot from what happened in the course. So you see statistics, you see funnels, but you can't really point on the component or the, the uh, place in timeline or what caused this dropout. So uh, we encourage the instructional designers to use, uh, at least where you need to do some assessment, uh, to use uh, edX native components. And um, one of the things that we saw during the pilot is uh, a gap between the Ministry of Education uh, discipline leader and the instructional designers that produced the MOOC. Actually, of the, the 31 courses, there were some courses that didn't go up on the platform on November just because the person from the Ministry of Education wasn't happy about the MOOC. They said, hey, th that's not what I expected. We, we sat here three months ago, and now this product is very different than what I imagined. So one of the things that we're going to do in the next cohort is, is to use a, a more rigor course design protocol, and I'm going to um, demonstrate now. So you all know these tables, Excel worksheets, uh, describing section, subsection, units, what is the component, what is the learner effort for every um, of, of every row, but what we added to that um, template is uh, analytics of the, the course in terms of pedagogy and in terms of learner effort. Uh, so this course, which is uh, about uh, digital literacy, you can see that uh, most of it is practice, 10% uh, is communication, and only 20% is knowledge delivery. Um, when setting expectation between the customer, in that case, the discipline leader from the Ministry of Education and the vendor producing the course, when you can see, uh, you, you can have an outlook from 30,000 feet on the course, before you even turned on your computer, that's a very powerful tool. Um, and we hope that this will help in the, the expectation settings. So here's a, a little different outlook. So we take all the learner effort that you saw in the table two slides ago, and we display in terms of uh, learner effort how, how, how does the learner journey in that MOOC is going to look like. Uh, in that case, because we believe that digital literacy is all about active learning, 70% of the course is the learner being interactive with the computers. And only 3% will be uh, uh, videos. Um, so th that's an example, but you can design using these charts and make better expectation settings with your customer. And the part I love the most about the, our template is this one. That's the course. That's the timeline of the course. And each color code represents a specific type of component. And the higher the bar is, the uh, larger the uh, learner effort is. So you can have by a glimpse on this chart, you can see how the, the journey of the learner is in terms of different learning styles and different components. Um, one of the other things we wanted to see is if that's cost effective and addressing uh, Fiona's uh, lecture in terms of money. Um, so we found out that if we take the current uh, uh, traditional teacher's training, which costs the, the state of Israel 600 million shekels a year, 
and we take half of it and deliver that to the digital platform, that's going to cost only 370 million shekels. And with investment of 40 million shekels a year, that's the budget uh, um, we're going to expand on doing that 50% delivery, we're going to save 230 million shekels a year that could use for building future learner uh, innovation spaces, uh, um, pay teachers hours for discussions, uh, uh, private tutoring, etc. So not only Revital earns from this model, but also the Ministry of Education. Um, we have uh, nine minutes for questions. So thank you. You mean this one? Yes. How are you measuring the learner effort? So we have um, a, a table we, we, we've created that takes what we call the output time and converts that to learner effort. It's based on some research. Uh, for example, one video output time is equivalent to two minutes of learner effort in, in that conversion. So w we created a sort of a, a conversion key for that. Fiona? Not as MOOCs, like general face-to-face -face trainings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, as you can see, it's a very initial phase of the project. We've, we've just launched and uh, our portal with 31 courses, that, that's not an issue finding a specific uh, competency there. Currently, we uh, use different disciplines. So like, hey, English teachers, these are your six courses you can choose from. Uh, the same with science and math. Uh, in the future, we will have to be more sophisticated than that. Uh, I, I'd say that probably our challenge is to ask you a very simple series of questions that will help us understand what is your need. Because most of the needs in this project are pedagogic and are not discipline related. So uh, that's a great question. I, I still don't have a very good answer for that. All oh, right. Uh, so, uh, in general, inter inter what what is called here is interactivity is anything you do without leaning back on your chair. So, if it's answering a multiple uh, question, multiple choice question, posting a uh, a post in the discussion forum, um, putting your pin in, in a Google map interaction, um, so that sort of activity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this was, oh, okay, so, so first, thanks for the feedback. I, I use this just for the, the demonstration, okay. So, 
so th that's actually the, the, the goal of, of keeping that uh, data tracked. Um, so one of the things that we want to do uh, after the, all the courses end on, on July is take the results of, of the courses and try to see if we can spot any patterns that, uh, um, that, that uh, project success or failure. That's actually the reason we're tracking that data. Okay, so thank you very much again. Enjoy the rest of the day.
Can you hear me okay? Right, everybody, we're going to get started. No, no, I'm going to give, okay. You good? I'm good. <laughs> All right. Everybody, please welcome Elliot Visconti. He's going to talk about using OpenEdX to build an online uh, MS program at Notre Dame. Give him a round of applause. Yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, as maybe a parent, I um, have a proclivity for being casual. So I hope what we can do is have a conversation. Um, I will talk for a few minutes, and then we will carry on from there. Are you hearing me OK? Is the, the feed is OK? OK, fantastic. Um, so again, my name is Elliot Visconti. I'm the university's chief academic digital officer. I'm also an associate provost. I um, and Third, I am an English professor. Um, actually, I started a technology company, too, so I have four, four different things in my locker, as it were. Um, and so my job at the university is to lead our online and digital strategy and think about how Notre Dame embraces the future of higher education, how Notre Dame embraces the future of learning, and how we work uh, as partners with industry and other great like-minded institutions. So we have, we have, uh, I have that portfolio. It's a really exciting opportunity, and one of the, um, the embodiments of that work is a recent data science program that I'm going to talk about mostly today. Okay. So um, several years ago, we, like um, a couple of other institutions, um, worked with industry to start thinking about how we design a really future-oriented oriented and industry-aligned degree. And so we um, identified data science as an area that I think we're all well aware is a very um, heavily in demand domain. And so with our friends at AT&T, we started to build out a program. Um, I should say, I'm sorry I meant to get to this slide earlier. So um, at Notre Dame, I should just talk a little bit to give you some color. At Notre Dame, we have a sort of three-part strategy. Our first, the first prong of our strategy is to enhance learning and teaching at Notre Dame for our existing students and faculty, right? So to really sprint forward on um, helping our students get what they came for, helping our faculty to create a really transformational learning experience. The second tier, the second strategic goal is to extend the reach, right? So to, to bring, we're out in South Bend, Indiana, we're not by a major metro, we'd like to bring uh, the Notre Dame experience to as many um, students as possible who can't come to campus, who don't live in the region, et cetera. And that, of course, gives us access to a global population of learners. Um, and then finally, of course, we're interested, as everybody is here, um, in education and enrichment for its own sake, right? Because any great university should be committed to and caring about um, education for the public benefit, right? The global public benefit. So one of the, as I say, one of the embodiments that's mostly localized in the second of those three tiers, which is extending the reach, is the online data science program that we put together um, and launched a year ago in August. So we're right now going through our first cohort. And uh, we did that um, with, as a partnership with our friends at AT&T. And you know, one of the exciting things about the opportunity for that program was a chance to get, building that program was a chance to give our faculty the platform to do some really creative work. So we made some interesting, um, this is a linear models course with a professor, Alan Hubner. We made some really fantastic video content. It's beautiful. We wanted to make sure our production values were very high, but we know that, of course, the production values don't necessarily translate into effective learning. So our goal was always to make sure that we were focusing on learning first. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So, but we, we wanted to make sure we brought our A game, as it were, and brought some uh, cinematic intention to some of the video assets. Um, the, the sort of the underlying goals of the program were to build out um, a learning system and experience that was aligned with the principles of liberal education, the underlying long-term analytical habits of mind that we know are going to sustain our students not for the next few years, but over their lifetime. Right? So we began with a blank piece of paper and rooted our, our data science degree within the principles of liberal education. That said, we also had a couple of very specific um, functional requirements, if you like. One was that we wanted to make this online degree as participatory as possible. Right? So not just sort of receiving of you know, content and applied in linear models and so on, but rather to make it as participatory and interactive as possible. We wanted to use our live synchronous learning with as, with as much impact as possible, so not simply seminar discussions, but also 
live office hours and other forms of live events, whether it means you know, taking a campus event and connecting our students or otherwise. And of course, we wanted to build as many interactive cases and simulations as we could. So we wanted to make sure that we were doing something that was um, fundamentally true and authentic to who we are as a university. Right? And that was no, our, sort of our number one goal, right? Be authentic to who we are as a university. We know we, know we have, a, I think, a strong, well-articulated mission and self-concept, and so we wanted to design a program that reflected those, those principles. Um, so we did a lot of fun stuff. Does anybody know who this is? Some of you are people, probably do. It's Hadley Wickham, who is the chief scientist at our studio, and so he's a friend of the program, and we did a, a, live, um, a live event with Hadley where we um, put him on camera live, and we gave him a problem to solve, and we asked him to model the data science problem. So it was kind of a um, trial by fire from, from a great expert. He seemed to enjoy it, so, and our students did. So we did a lot of fun stuff. Um, well, the other thing I want to say about the program, and this is all going to explain, you know, uh, we'll get to Open edX in a moment. The other thing to say about the program is that it's, it's cohorted, it's lockstep, so it's, there are no electives. Everybody takes the same courses on the same sequence. You start in August and you end the following May, so it's 15 months, five consecutive semesters, um, at a half pace, half time pace. So everybody in the program has a job, as a working professional, and so on. So this is the Candyland, I call it the Candyland degree. So this is the, sort of the Candyland of how you, you know, go from you know, the, the gumdrop forest of, of probability and stats and so on all the way up. Um, so it's a, very, it's, a very, um, it's a very coherent and very carefully controlled program. It's very different from a large um, you know, multi, a large catalog of courses, right? And we, again, we did this because it felt right to us and, and that's, that was pretty much the principle. Um, we also, of course, do all of the usual uh, marketing, promotion, telling the story of what we think is differentiated and interesting about this, this program and why it aligns with Notre Dame's mission to be a force for good in the world. So we have a deep um, thesis of data science for social good embedded in the program. All of this is leading us to a question of, well, okay, we did all of that work. We're building out a, re what we are really proud of is a high quality online program that speaks to the university's sense of mission that allows our students to be working in industry aligned ways to get a degree that we think will launch them on their next sort of steps in their career. Okay, that's, that's what a university should do, right? Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we built a technology stack that was going to reflect those underlying principles and that was going to allow those underlying principles to come forth. And one of the first decisions that we made was to insist that the, the, the program itself was the controlling principle of the technology and of the learning environment. So as is often the case, we think about the course as the, the fundamental unit. The course, it might be a very small course, it might be a micro course, but we think of the course as the quantum of knowledge, right, of the quantum of experience. And so what we wanted to do is say, well, wait a minute, let's think about the program, the coherent program itself as the organizing principle and build a system, build an environment around the program itself so that the courses are subcomponents of the single integrated whole. And that was the, one of the first sort of technology principles that we began with. And so in order to sustain that, um, we wanted to, in order to realize that, excuse me, we felt that what we needed to do was to deliver a system that was an all-in-one place learning environment, right? Where the students who are busy working professionals, what they don't want to do is to be juggling five or six platforms. Well, I've got this, this that, and the other, each with different identity management systems, some of which are you know, inside the university, some of which are out and you've got all kinds of integrations and so on. So we wanted to minimize the chaos and deliver a sort of an all-in-one experience for the benefit of our students, be particularly because we know how busy they are. Right? These are people who are working full-time and taking classes at night and so on. And so we built a stack um, which starts with a identity management, you know, security checkpoint, um, has a top layer, what we call the Nexus dashboard, and then sits on an open edX stack. And so, this is the first, this is a visualization of uh, the social layer that sits on top of the stack, right? And so if you think about the program as the organizing principle or the controlling metaphor, if you like, 
right? You need a meeting place. You need a, a nexus, a, a, a gathering point where everybody can run into each other and have un, un, unanticipated encounters, serendipitously discover that they're working on the homework at the same time, and immediately do a sort of peer-to-peer -peer study session or have live office hours with their professors who might happen to be on the platform at the time. So we were trying to build as much as possible that sense of, as I said, unanticipated encounters, right, around the social gathering place at the top of the program. So you come in and you enter and you run into your friend or your colleague or your fellow student, right? And then we also have a series of, so just on the, you can see, I'll just give you the, the sort of the narrative. On the left side, you can see the course, the course titles, right? So that's where you get to your courseware, right? Down the center is a kind of timeline function which pulls your Google Calendar and so forth and allows you also to share articles and relevant information and entries and posts and events and create events and things like that. So you have a, a central sort of timeline-like channel which allows people to communicate with each other, share, as I said, share news and information, create events and the like. And on the right side, a few modest integration points as well as a social feature which allows for you to see who's studying at the time and then again create a, either a chat or pick up a, an open source Slack tool called Mattermost, which is very much like Slack. I don't know if anyone knows, some of you guys must know Mattermost, but um, where it allows us to have our discussions and threaded conversations as well as one-on-one -on -one chat in real time, right? So it takes all of these tools and builds an integration, at, builds an integration at the top layer of the uh, learning stack before the student gets into the Open edX platform, right? So rather than diving right into the courseware, the student lands here, they get news information, they get potential access to their peers, their friends, their teachers, after which point they dive into probability and statistics or linear models or what have you, right? So that was one of the principles that we felt like was really a crucial differentiator for our program and would allow us to build a sense of cohesion between the students and the students and between the students and the faculty. So it's very much an investment in creating that learning community, that social learning community, that for us, with a modestly sized program, right, felt, a very, felt like an appropriate and, in fact, a wise investment. Um, so that's where we started with the, the Nexus dashboard. We had some of these sort of standard, I guess what I would say are fairly standard and predictable for an audience of you know, some developers and others. We'll see, you know, some of the predictable functionalities and needs where we might say, we need to do all of these things and we want to have it look great. We want it to be efficient. We want it to be time sensitive and so forth. Um, so this is a sort of a, a, a sort of a schematic that our friends at Extension Engine put together for us who helped us build all of this out. Um, so we have, again, the integration points on the top, the courses, and then we have Open edX powering the courseware experience itself. So a couple of things that we wanted to make sure we, we needed to address, and some of these will be more or less familiar, but we wanted to make sure also that we were delivering for our instructors the kind of experience that they wanted and they came to expect. And that is to say, enough information about a population of 16 or 20 or 22 students in a particular class section, right? And the existing sort of off the shelf solution was not as effective for that as some of the traditional campus LMSs. So we knew we had to do some work on the gradebook, which we, had, which we did, um, and are in the process of contributing that back to the, um, to the edX platform. So that was one of those moments where we knew that, you know, Open edX's genealogy being a scalable online learning platform, the instructor experience was a little bit, we had to do a little bit of monkey wrenching to get it exactly where we wanted it to be for, um, for our instructors. And that's still an ongoing process, as I suspect we can talk about a little bit more. So we did some customizations up here. We spent a lot of time uh, working on the gradebook and some, nest, some new X blocks and a new theme. So it really felt like our own system, right, that was custom designed for this program that had sort of respect, uh, reflected our, not only what our instructors needed, but also the sense of the, the ethos of the program, if you like. And so this is, um, this is just an illustration of the theme that we brought into the the platform, so we, we um, s some sort of streamlined and simplified the UI a little bit and you know, gave it some Notre Dame branding but also made it very much sort of very, very clean, simple page back and forth and so forth. Now why do we do all that? Well, that's, again, that's a good topic for discussion. Why do we do all that? 
right? And someone, someone said to me, why don't you just use the campus LMF, which is Sakai? And we know that there are a number of answers to those questions. Um, why did we do it? We felt like Open edX was the right choice for us because it was open source. So our faculty and the university both felt like the fundamental underlying principles of an open source learning platform would not only give us the benefit to participate in and learn from a community, but also allow us to contribute back to the community because that any learnings and any contributions that we make are going to be shared among the group. Right? I don't need to, I think, reaffirm this for this, this audience. That was an important decision point for us, right? to participate in an open source community that was nonprofit and that was fundamentally oriented towards democratization was a very important, um, a very important motive, a driver. Um, we also wanted a, a platform that was born online. Our campus LMS was not designed or intended to be an online learning platform in the same way that the Open edX platform was. It's it used to manage and sort of administer campus-based campus classes. So we wanted to make sure that we were using a tool and a system that was designed and would continue to be designed for online courses and for online learning instead of for campus courses and we can just sort of rig it up for an online degree. We also had a lot of experience working with the edX platform and our design team. Um, so we knew that operationally that we felt like this was the right platform for us in, in terms of its, you know, sort of its principles and its functionality. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a system that was scalable over time. So we started, unlike um, um, many programs, instead of starting at, at scale, we started at a very modest scale. We started small, but we wanted to make sure that whatever our goals were as a university or as a program, right, and those are often very different goals, but whatever our goals are, we would have the ability to scale up as much as possible, instead of trying to take something at scale and to, to render it for a 12-person program, because we have a few of those. We have a couple of degree programs at Notre Dame, which have between 12 and 40 graduate students, and they, they can't and don't want to get any bigger, right? Because they, the, the, we only have faculty capacity, and we only have, they're in sort of niche programs, and so to be able to make sure we start with those small-scale programs, but give us the opportunity to scale was a very important driver, again, of the choice. We wanted to be differentiated. It's a very crowded market, um, particularly in data science, but online graduate degrees generally, particularly in STEM and industry line subjects, a very crowded marketplace. And so we knew that, that doing a customized stack would help us with differentiation. It's a minor driver of, of the, of the uh, choice, but it's an important one. Right? Um, and most importantly, I would say, well, we have two most importance, but uh, one of the most crucial decisions was ultimately autonomy. That we wanted to make sure that we were building a system that w we could use for whatever purposes and whatever applications we needed, whether it be to take the courseware and reapply it to an online summer course, to apply the courseware to a campus course, to share and partner with other institutions, which we're doing, we're gonna roll out a, a really exciting collaboration shortly in this area. So to give us maximum autonomy as an institution, pulling the Open edX um, platform into our learning stack was absolutely the right decision. It was essential, it allows us to give, to, to have a system that we can use for, whether it's our alumni engagement, whether it's for our own courses, whether it's for collaborations, whether it's for our graduate programs, give us maximum autonomy. And as an institutional decision, right, autonomy allows you to do things that a, a revenue share partner might not, would not allow you to do, right, very, very plainly, right. Um, and finally, cohesion, right, program cohesion, and cohesion that is between students and students, students and faculty, and the cohesion of the program as a, com a community of scholars, of, of students and teachers working together. We felt like building that technology stack, infusing it with the principles, as well as the courses, infusing them with the principles, right, of liberal education and commitment to social good and industry alignment all going together, right, would allow us to build a system that was meaningfully coherent and gave the students a chance to participate peer in a peer-to-peer -peer community. So all of those were the, the sort of the drivers of the decision-making process. Um, you know, it's a work in progress. I would say it's, it's an exciting work in progress. It has challenges. 
Um, it's, you know, there's a, a never-ending sort of DevOps struggle. I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of work that goes into this, but it felt like the right choice for us. And it, uh, we're really happy with the performance of the system, and we're really excited to be both um, learning from and participating in the open source community. Um, the last thing I would say is that we're always eager to have partners. And so if you have a program or an application where you'd like to learn more about what we're up to, we really see this as a partnership and that we know that if you're in the room, you're committed to, to moving the needle on the future of learning. And so that's what we're about. We'd like to participate in that work in whatever ways we can. So um, that's a very brief rundown of how we use the Open edX stack, um, and it was only part of it, but um, what we did to try and power our online degree, and I would love to have conversation. So let's talk. Thank you. See you I told you I would go. Yeah, I'm just gonna ask that we use the microphone for the benefit of everyone online. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, can you talk about the main uh, difficulties that you have to face to set up this, uh, this project? The main difficulties? Um, I, you know, I think anytime you do customization, I mean, there's a standard sort of anytime you, do, you know, set up an open source anything, there's going to be, you know, setup cost. But the more customizations that you do, the more then reverse sort of engineering you've got to, to manage. So I would say that some of the customizations on the gradebook created a lot of unanticipated costs and unanticipated slowdowns. Um, what I would also say, and this is, you know, no critique of anybody, uh, including our friends at Extension Engine who um, helped us with this program, um, we do not have an in-house engineering team um, that was sort of riding honcho on it. We had great talent in our IT organization and who would advise, but we did not have a s couple of dedicated engineers who were full-time university resources, right? And so that meant we had, to, we had to partner with a third party, which was Extension Engine. And that means you, it adds, you know, not only cost, but it also adds sort of negotiation and time and delay and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, were I to do it again, I, I would try to hire a, at least one, but ideally two in-house engineers to partner. We couldn't have done it um, with our in-house capacity come what may. But having your own, your own in-house engineer, I think, is, is probably the key, right? I mean, I, the other thing I would say about that is that we, we really, um, you know, we have a smallish digital learning team. We have about nine, I think, is that right? Yeah, about nine people. And so we needed to partner with a third party, and that was a, a, absolutely the right decision because it allowed us to create autonomy and have aligned interests. So, yeah. Yeah, is your Open edX instance integrated with your s student information system? It is. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. It was on one of the diagrams, but yeah, it's it's fully plugged into our banner. We're it's a we're a banner school, so it's fully interoperable with banners. So we have all the ad, you know, all the the various ad drop and all that stuff, which was also a schlep. I mean, if I may did say, it work yourself? we did a com combination of in our in-house team and and our our engineering team. Do you have a residential um, master's in data science program? We do. And what's the tuition difference between that and your online The one? tuition difference? Yes. Uh, the, the tuition for the online master's degree is $48,000. It's a fixed price. So when you start in August, the tuition rate stays the same through to graduation. Um, our online, our residential is a much more traditional one year full time, purely residential. And that one, I don't, I mean, it's the standard university graduate tuition rate. It's right around the same, but I, maybe 49,000. So there, there's a very modest difference. So is the content identical between your online and, and residential? Uh, the content is, it's not, no. I mean, the, the, the residential degree program will, the student will select from whatever's available in that particular mm -hmm. year. So the level is the same, the instructors are the same but they may have local variations and the pacing may be a little different, right? So you might, you know, you might have a different, you'll have a different model. But it's, I mean, it's, it, their graduate course is taught by um, a variety of different departmental faculty, but it's, it, it's not a absolutely yeah. direct yeah, yeah, yeah. like for like. So do you provide any student services in terms of like career services to your online? Absolutely. 
Yeah, that's part of the part of the offering that we really. Um, so we we provide the students with career services and placement. We have live campus immersion, so we get the students together physically, both on campus, which is required, and then you know on on site and industry partners. We have career services. We have. Um, several full-time staff members who work on student services, coaching, uh, the kind of the advising and, and, and uh, sort of operational management stuff so that anytime students have a problem, they immediately have a person to talk to. And that person knows who they are, where they live, what their, you know, what their life looks like, why this might be a difficult week, so then they can be the liaison to the professor, right, who is also going to be aware of some of that stuff. So. I mean that's you know that's what we have we have we have a small program so we can pull it off. Yeah, we cap so we started at thirty six, and so we have thirty two. We had a couple of guys go start a company. Thirty six, thirty six. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not thirty six hundred. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Six, no, it was 36,000, actually. No. <laughs> no, 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 36. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, as I say, I mean, you know, the thought was start small and scale. For us, that was the right decision. And, you know, we respect and admire the work of other partners who have um, started with, at scale. And we don't see these as competitive. We think there's a lot of different options out there, and students should be able to find the choice that works for them. Um, hey, for John. <laughs> so uh, I think this is the first online uh, degree program that's on Open edX, and I think the big sounds uh, true. I think the big chunk um, that need you know was must uh, change was around the grade book. Can you describe a little bit of some of the changes to the grade book that that you had to make and maybe why? I would Why say, I mean, I can describe it in a very vague and unsatisfying way, um, but I know there's others who can do a better job, who might be in the back there from my team. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that we made the gradebook as user-friendly for the instructor as possible, because the, the gradebook as received was very well suited for scanning the activity of a thousand students as appropriate, right? And so, the ability to look at the individual student level and to give the student those a student a more sort of granular and focused um, orientation to their performance, particularly on things that weren't necessarily machine graded. I mean, something very simple, right? So that you have in a live class, you have subjective things like participation grades, or you have other sor sorts of non-machine graded stuff. Being able to pr push that out to the students was, I think, a crucial one. What did I miss, Lori? Lori Kirkner, everybody, director of the ODL. Um, so we built in filtering in the gradebook to make it easier for faculty to just look at what was going on in week one or just look at a particular content type across an entire semester or group of students. And uh, let's see, we put in the ability for faculty to enter all of their grades before releasing them to students instead of the first grade that they put in being available to one student. They wanted to sort of hold and consider what they were really um, evaluating and make sure that at the end of grading they didn't want to circle back and make any modifications. Uh, but, the but the filtering and sorting was a big enhancement as was being able to enter in um, manual grades. I mean the, the, the ultimate principle here is to make it as um, responsive as possible to our faculty. And so we continue to get feature requests and insights and all of that. And again, it's a, it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. uh, this is sort of prequel to the gradebook sure. question is uh, how exactly did assessments work? Do assessments work? Yeah, I mean, so, and the final exam and all of that. Yeah, I mean, it pretty much there are, there are a variety of different answers, uh, different modalities of assessment. So there are knowledge, you know, knowledge checks. I mean, all the stuff in the standard platform. We have, we also use ProctorTrack for verified um, proctored high stakes exams in some of the math classes. Um, and that's been a solution that's worked really nicely for us. Um, some faculty have final projects 
we have we use the aura, you know the RA. We use a lot of the other um, sort of uh, short answer tools and so forth. Um, so there's a variety of different assessments, but as far as like a traditional high stakes exam, we use a ver verificence proctor track solution. Is that is that helpful? Is that okay? Yeah. I apologize if you have, if you said this early on. Uh, start to finish, how long did this take? Um, to with build the team you to had build the to, from and from concept to first student enrolled. Oh boy, from concept, well, it depends what you mean. You mean the program itself? Because we started with the curriculum, right? So we started with the vision and the industry relationship and all of that. And we did a lot of planning with the faculty to say, what is it that you want to create, all of that. So that was actually the precursor to the technology and the learning design and the course building and all of that. I guess more from when you engaged the partner and when you started to build. Well, it's still ongoing, um, but I would say about two years. About 18 months, something like that seem right? Something like that. We started about 12, we started functionally about 12 months before the first students arrived on campus for the four day immersion with the course building and, and so forth. And you know, there were moments when that pace seemed a little reckless. Uh, yeah. Always good to have a little more time. <laughs> you mentioned the partner. So what, what was the relationship or what was the interaction with the partner? Uh, that, that's a question. The partner, you mean the firm? No, the AT&T. Oh, oh. Um, so AT&T has been a really great ongoing partner for us. They've partnered with Georgia Tech and some others as well. Um, so they helped us with some underwriting. Um, but mostly they, and we, we have a deal with them where we provide uh, discounts for their students um, separately from that. And most importantly, they provide an ongoing curricular um, collaborator. So we will talk to them about a project, whether it be a small project or a large project, um, and we will get tasks, projects, intelligence from their data science teams and then use that to inform our curricular decision making industry whether it, industry advisory yeah so it's it's industry, industry advisory but it's actually quite um, quite a deep relationship instead of here's some stuff you ought to do and this is kind of what's important to us they'll give us data and they'll give us problems and we'll use those and build learning assets out of those and we also like to we listen to them as much as possible um, about what their challenges are, what they forecast, the needs are, and that we have a, a lot of other industry advisors as any program in this area is going to have. And so we, as we listen to our industry advisors, it helps us to think about, okay, well, what are we going to make asynchronous material out of, and what are we going to either save for the live sessions, what are we going to do in person, or what do we need to get out ahead of? So a lot of that sort of forecasting intelligence is also one function that they are, they're the kind of, you know, the, the lead um, yeah. partner. Kind of a follow on since you were going online, did you ever consider uh, getting, there's so much content out there. Yeah. So, the obvious question, I'll let you answer. Well, I know, why don't you, well, what is it? I, well, the obvious question there's a is, lot of obvious not, questions. You know. The obvious question to me is, why not look to other sources for uh, getting content and, and, and using it? I mean, why course limit content? yourself to your faculty? That's, maybe that's, like, uh, yeah, okay, well, <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I mean, what I would say is that for us, the, there are a couple things, starting with the, the sense of what is it that we are about as a university, right? And what, we have mission questions, but we also really believe deeply in the principles of liberal education, which I was alluding to. And so we wanted the opportunity to, to insinuate those goals, those principles into the courseware. So a good example or an, ex an illustration of that would be uh, focus on data science ethics, right? So instead of just having a course that is a plug-in, we wanted to make it a leitmotif or a theme that would go through, a thread that would go through a lot of our other courses. So you can take a linear models course. We wanted to make sure that that ethics theme, the social good theme, was carried through the program. So in order to do that, we wanted to, we, we felt it was a, both appropriate and exciting to put 
some of our most talented teachers to work on this program. We also know that um, the more that we do to give our faculty the platform to push the boundaries of learning, the better the benefits are for our campus students because then those faculty will come back and be energized by the new pedagogies and focuses on efficacy and so forth and carry that into not only their own classes but also into the classes surrounding them, et cetera. Right? So I think that those are, those are two of the, there's others, but those are two of the big drivers of that decision. Uh, unfortunately, we are at time, so uh, I apologize. Um, well, <laughs> Last one. That's a, we have... <laughs> we can, we can, well, I'll, I'll field right. it in 30 seconds or less, yeah. I promise. What's the? Uh, quick question, that is there a difference on accreditation of this degree and the full-time students who are no. in class? Yeah, it's the same, same department, same faculty, same, you know, I think it's actually the same degree printed on the diplomas, et cetera. So it's, it's all part of the same offering. This is just delivered online. So thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.